Okay, so uh, the recording started now. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and also the opportunity to uh, give this talk on uh, our experience on uh, power tricks uh, in Denmark, uh, which is really a topic that has uh, gone from uh, something li living only in, in very uh, small uh, groups of specialists, uh, I'd say three years ago. Very few people knew what power trade was all about. And today, at least in, in Denmark, uh, I'll say that uh, you cannot open the newspaper on, uh, and not find something on power tricks in, in the uh, business section uh, more or less every day. So, so it has really grown uh, to, to be uh, something that has looked very much into as uh, one of the answers to, to the climate crisis. Uh, today, I, I would. Uh, try to, to cover what, what do we think about power to x and also not only power to x but also some associated technologies that, that might uh, be used for, for replacing the uh, fossil fuels in especially in the transport sector but also in the industry um, so but uh, First on, perhaps I, I should just give you a, a brief introduction. I know that our company, uh, Kowi, as we be pronounced in Denmark, uh, is perhaps not that well known in, in the UK. Never, even though we have an office, we have a, a quite lot of office there as well. We, we are a consulting group. Uh, had a turnover of 900. Uh, yeah, it, it says 900 euros. It must be a missed it, a typo. I mean, it's 900 million euros. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be that impressive. Uh, seven and a half thousand employees and uh, world class competences in both engineering but also economics and environmental science. Uh, we have quite a long history with 19 years of history and a lot of projects going on uh, all the time in, I'd say, all fields of engineering, uh, both in energy but also all other disciplines of engineering, really. Um, If we look into to our expertise within the uh, energy uh, sector, I'd say that, of course, I would really like to highlight our, our expertise in carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilization, CTS and CCU, and power tracks. Uh, but in addition to that, we also cover wind energy, solar energy, new bioenergy solutions, biomass and waste to energy, district heating, cooling, and oil and gas. So, so, so I say that, that we we have the competences in, in more or less the entire value chain of uh, in all disciplines of, of energy uh, going on. And, and as you can see on this few selected references, I, I'll not go through all of them. It's just that we have renewable power, wind, solar. We have references in biomass and waste on carbon capture and storage on integration of systems on distribution of fuels and uh, gas. We have uh, on electrolysis, on uh, electrofuels, on biofuels, and paralysis, just to mention a few uh, references that, that we've been working on, in particularly uh, during the, the last, uh, I'd say, three years. Uh, this has really grown. Uh, so, so, um, so that was just just very briefly about uh, our, our company before I, I uh, turn my attention to, to the real topic of, of the. Uh, uh, speak of today. If we look at green fuels uh, and how to actually utilize renewable power on the uh, left hand side here, uh, how do we actually tra transform that into something that could be useful? Oh, sorry, uh, a bit fast there. That could be useful uh, in the uh, in the transport sector so that we can uh, replace the fossil fuel. Well, of course, we can take the direct electrification and simply use electricity direct in uh, both industry and uh, railway electric vehicles, also for domestic heating as heat pumps. And uh, so, so, I mean, that, that is the, the most straightforward way to, to do it. But uh, eventually it turns out that uh, in some applications, you, you really cannot use electricity directly. And therefore, you rather need to go by what we could call indirect electrification of power tracks, where you take the electricity from your renewable source and through electrolysis of water produce hydrogen. That's called green hydrogen. I'll come back to this with about the colors later, but we call it 
green hydrogen. And that could be used in industries, in particular fertilizer industries. It could be uh, in, uh, in uh, steel, uh, steel mills. It could be uh, uh, other heavy industries. It can be used in ferries for, for uh, transportation and also uh, at least uh, in long term on, on heavy road transport. Or we can even go further down the line, say, OK, hydrogen is a gas and therefore not very complex. So, so it's not very well suited for, for instance, uh, long distance shipping and uh, aviation. So there we need to go to further processing of the hydrogen in order to obtain green fuels that can replace the fossil um, counterparts uh, with something that is similar, chemically similar to what we have today, but can be a green alternative for cargo or long distance uh, shipping for aviation and also uh, for, for heavy road transport in the case that we cannot really use any of the other options of here. So that's just very briefly to go into these different technology pathways that is possible here. And I'll say that I'll go far more into detail with these uh, along the presentation. So it's just to give you an overview on what are the topics that we're going to touch upon uh, here. Uh, there might be something that you think, oh, this is missing from, from the presentation, that there might even be more alternatives. Yes, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not pretend to cover everything uh, indeed in this, but, but hopefully at least give, give you a sense of uh, the, the, even the complexity I, I have here. But everything, at least on this slide, starts with the access to renewable energy, renewable power from solar and wind in particular. Uh, I think that we should uh, just uh, just uh, have a bit of view about what are we going to, to increase the renewable power output in uh, Denmark. So if we look at the renewable power, to, to actually, uh, Denmark has set for us a quite ambitious target for uh, 2030, where we would like to reduce our uh, CO2 emission by 70%, and also uh, for aviation be, uh, at least for the domestic aviation, uh, be uh, completely climate neutral uh, to, to have only green fuels in our domestic flights. It might be a bit easy. I mean, we're a small country, but nevertheless have some domestic flights. In order to achieve these targets, we uh, need to, even though we have a substantial amount of wind energy in the Danish energy system today, I mean, around 50% of our electricity is covered by wind energy today in Denmark on an annual basis. But in order to actually increase this further and also cover the transport sector and industry, we need to increase the uh, amount of renewable even further. And that is, will be in particularly on offshore wind because we don't think that uh, building more onshore is really feasible. There will be a slight increase, but that will mainly be by retrofitting existing wind turbines. And then, yeah, you can see that uh, it seems that solar is going to, to be uh, very, very significantly increased. I think that's mainly due to the fact that solar is not very large today, so you'll get very easily get a very large percentage of increase. So, uh, but, but the, the, the real bulk is coming from the offshore wind. Uh, and in order to, to, uh, to, to have more offshore wind, we need to, to do something really, really substantial uh, to harvest the offshore wind resources of the North Sea. The North Sea is actually, uh, and I mean, you, you also live next to the North Sea. The North Sea is actually one of the best wind resources worldwide. Uh, so so it's, it's really a resource that we have there uh, between our two countries. So what we will do, intend to do, is actually in order to establish a large amount of wind farms out in the North Sea, we need to collect all the power. And therefore, we need to build, we have uh, conceived an artificial island in order to have the sufficient infrastructure offshore to support in 2033 gigawatt of wind power, after that increase to 10 gigawatt. At the same time, we also will build out in the Baltic Sea, uh, two gigawatt of wind power, and actually make uh, Denmark actually has this island over here, Bornholm as part of Denmark, that will be 
also an energy island, so to speak, that it will uh, act as a hub for the Baltic Sea, but there might also be even more uh, so renewable energy uh, built out in the uh, future after uh, 2030. So these are the plans in order to actually put more renewable into the system that can be utilized to decarbonize our transport and industry sector. For that part, the energy islands are really instrumental. We have to the uh, left, the artificial island uh, in the North Sea that will be acting as a hub here only. Uh, it has not been constructed yet, so we only have the nice architectural drawings. In the middle, we have the island of Bornholm uh, in the Baltic Sea. And I, I have also included here the Ag Agri Winters project that is uh, being uh, promoted by Germany, which is also actually utilizing a remote island of Helgoland to uh, be the center of uh, offshore multi gigawatt wind farm and also connect hydrogen pipelines to shore. So the Germans are thinking in the same lines about actually utilizing islands or even perhaps in the future also constructing artificial islands in order to harvest the wind resources in the North Sea. Uh, we are very much involved in the uh, initial phases of uh, the uh, designing of the uh, artificial island in the uh, North Sea. It's called Wind Island. This is a Danish name for Wind Island. Uh, and we have uh, created a small video here that I do hope that I can share with you. Uh, let me just see. Uh, Just a moment. Hopefully you can see now.
yeah. So that was, uh, say, the uh, vision and the uh, architectural presentation of the island, not necessarily the way it's going to be ex exactly or look at uh, uh, being constructed or realized in, in, the, uh, in the end. But, but I think at least uh, we, we have really made a vision about how, how uh, it could, could uh, be here. Oh, sorry, that was, uh, let me just see, next slide here, yeah. One of the questions that we, we, we very often uh, asked about the island is that it must be outrageously expensive to co construct an artificial island uh, in the middle of the North Sea. Well, actually, it turns out that the wind turbines and the electrical systems are really the, uh, the, the heavy uh, part of the capex here. The island itself is only 5%. That's, that's actually quite surprising. Uh, so, so that's really uh, the reason why, why we be thinking about this. Uh, because having the island there would uh, make it far easier to, to collect the uh, power, uh, transform it to, to high voltage and transport it to shore. Uh, also serving as a maintenance hub so that we, because having all these wind turbines at the sea we require continuously maintenance. So, so having this maintenance hub uh, out there would, would really uh, be, be also very, very necessary in order to, to uh, have so many wind turbines in operation so far offshore. So therefore, uh, I, I think that that's, uh, that's also part of the uh, important part of the uh, the, the uh, uh, reason for, for the uh, island here is that, that it is actually very expensive to build the wind turbines and uh, it, it's, it's a minor uh, part to, to actually also construct the island. Uh, wind turbines, for those of you not uh, familiar with wind turbines uh, of today, they are really huge constructions themselves. Uh, and uh, also, it's it's a very very uh, uh, large area that we would cover. Uh, but as you can see at the former map, there's still plenty of space in the North Sea for far more uh, construction of uh, of wind farms. Um, so, so hopefully, this gave you a bit about uh, impression about the visions that we have in Denmark and the plans that we have, how to actually produce more renewable power which is where it all starts. And the real way how we can, whether it's dry electrification, or we go to the green hydrogen and green fuels, it all starts with renewable energy. So this is about renewable energy. And especially in Denmark, of course, we are focusing mostly on offshore wind because that's the resources that is readily available to our geographical location. Then of course, we could go for direct electrification. And uh, why do we actually need to think about fuels at all? Because if we look at uh, the energy losses in the system here from having uh, 100 kilowatt hours of electricity from the wind turbine, we would lose something in the transmission of the grid and something when we charge our battery powered uh, electric vehicle. It would also have some losses in the vehicle, but in the, roughly speaking, 70% of the original electricity would actually be available to drive the vehicle. On the other hand, if we uh, go through the uh, electric conversion, do electrolysis and produce hydrogen, we can then either compress the hydrogen or we can put it in liquefied state. Both of these requires a huge amount of energy and again, there's a conversion loss once we return the hydrogen into electricity that can drive the vehicle. Eventually turning out that only between 18 and 26 kilowatt hours of the original 100 kilowatt hours are available for a hydrogen uh, powered vehicle. So it might seem that the electric, due to the in enormously far more, <laughs> the far more efficient electric vehicle. Why do we actually think about hydrogen as fuels at all? 
It's mainly due to the fact that batteries are heavy and too heavy for long distance road transport. I think that batteries actually have a role to play in uh, trucks for shorter distances, but for long distances, that is trans-European road transport, they need to refuel and refuel fast. And you need to drive with heavy load and can transport it across the yard. Batteries does not seem to be the way. So for that, for that application, it must be hydrogen. But batteries will definitely have a role to play in regional road transport, also for, for uh, trucks. For shipping, batteries are certainly not the option for uh, high sea shipping across the oceans. You cannot have a container ship going by batteries from China to uh, Europe. But batteries can very well play a role for ferries, that is, reaching ports quite often and can be recharged. We have, for instance, uh, the ferry company Stena Line between Denmark and Sweden, where they have a ferry sailing for approximately three hours between Denmark and uh, one trip between Denmark and Sweden. They plan to have an electrical ferry for this trip uh, that will be uh, in operation in 27. For longer distances than this, hydrogen is most likely the answer for shipping. And uh, it can be used at least for ferries for slightly longer distances. For instance, between Denmark and Norway, a hydrogen powered ferry is planned uh, also in 27. Going even further distances with container ships, etc., I think that we should look towards either methanol or ammonia as liquid fuels that are dense and can be stored and have a high energy density and therefore are far more suitable for long distance shippings, where you cannot refuel every now and then. And then, of course, for aviation, I mean, it's pretty obvious that uh, batteries are heavy and uh, weight is certainly nothing, uh, not something that is uh, very good for aviation. So batteries would definitely play a role for, for small planes for very short distances and few passengers. But for short haul, medium haul, and long haul, batteries are simply too heavy. Hydrogen might in the future play a role, at least for short haul transport, but for medium haul and long haul, I'd say that we need aviation fuels that are chemical similar to aviation fuel of today, which is a very, very energy dense uh, fuel and therefore extremely suitable for aviation where every pound that you bring into the air counts. So that's the reason why we need the, uh, the fuels. Now we talk about hydrogen. And uh, when you talk about hydrogen, you often encounter uh, the uh, various ways of assigning colors to hydrogen. I'm not saying that these are all the colors that I've heard about, but at least I think these are some of the more common colors that you, you can encounter. And uh, just, just to talk about, just to talk over it briefly, so for those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, we talk about brown hydrogen, which is typically produced from coal and gasification, leading to quite high emissions. Then there's gray hydrogen produced from natural gas. I think that's the most common form today. They are produced quite substantial amount of hydrogen, especially for uh, refineries and chemical plants today uh, from, from uh, natural gas. That is gray hydrogen. Uh, may, well, well, the methane is heated with steam to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide. It leads to quite substantial uh, CO2 emissions as well. But we can actually take the brown or the gray and fit these with carbon capture uh, facilities at the tail end so that we capture the CO2 they emit and store it. Then it turns into blue hydrogen. Uh, it will not uh, capture all the CO2, but at least quite a lot, and therefore leading to far lower emissions. Uh, but it's also very energy intensive to uh, capture the, the CO2. So, so it would actually require even more energy. Then we have the green hydrogen, which is produced by renewable power and uh, electrolysis of water that we have assigned the name green hydrogen. 
I know that uh, it can lead to both confusion and also disagreement how these colors are assigned and uh, what is actually called green, blue, gray, etc. But at least now you have uh, been introduced to our way of, uh, of thinking about the colors. Uh, so, so, um, so, so that is the way we, we at least uh, name them. As I said, the green hydrogen is produced by renewable energy generation. Then we uh, split the water in an electrolysis unit uh, into oxygen and hydrogen. It can be then compressed into a state where it behaves, uh, I say, more or less like a liquid. It can even be liquefied, so we can either compress it to very high pressures or you can liquefy it for storage. And then it can be used uh, here as in a personal vehicle, but, but uh, really uh, most likely it would be for other uses uh, in the future. But that's just very shortly about uh, how green hydrogen is produced for those of you who are not aware of it. The technology here is very well known. Electrolysis has existed for hundreds of for 100 years. Uh, so, so why has this not been utilized before? It's simply down to price that green hydrogen is more expensive than the counterparts. We have here a forecast of the green hydrogen prices that is at today more expensive than the blue and also the gray. The gray being the cheapest today, but it is assumed in the future that uh, giving CO2 tax, et cetera, that the gray would increase in price. The blue hydrogen will stay all more, more or less level, at least in this study, whereas we expect a significant decrease in the green hydrogen. Uh, there are two scenarios here for green hydrogen, one more optimistic than the other. Uh, again, these kind of studies are, of course, very much subject to uh, changes in gas prices and electricity prices. We all know that uh, the electricity and gas prices has really uh, changed substantially within the last months. Um, it is actually the way that uh, gas prices, which determine the price of gray hydrogen because it's produced by natural gas. A gas price has, has for at least to, to a certain extent, at some time has risen to a level where it's even more expensive than the electricity price. And therefore, the gray hydrogen has during the autumn at some point been more expensive than the green hydrogen. So things are very volatile uh, at the moment. Uh, making these predictions, of course, uh, a bit hard to, to, uh, to, to uh, settle. But uh, the fact remains that green hydrogen is expected to become cheaper simply because the electrolysis units are at a stage where the wind turbines were, I'd say, 30 years ago. They were small, they were uh, very expensive, and they were not mass produced. Same things with electrolysis. It needs to be increased in module sizes. It needs to be more mass produced. And thereby, we expect the price to fall significantly. It also goes hand in hand with the expected decrease, continued decrease in the renewable power price. Because what we can see here, if you see what is actually, uh, what makes up the uh, distribution of uh, green hydrogen, we have the electricity making up 50% of the price of green hydrogen. So a decrease in electricity price by uh, improved or decreased power, power price from renewable really is uh, a key part of this. Then we actually have the uh, tariffs of at least in the Danish part of the, and I think it's quite common in the uh, European uh, <clears throat> electrical system that there's a high transmission cost, that transmission cost is actually not necessarily uh, promoting green hydrogen. So it might be that uh, there might be some changes in the tariff structures. Then we have the depreciations, uh, which is due to very high capex. So once the capex come down, we we'll also see a decrease in depre uh, depreciations. So therefore, we believe that there is reason, uh, there's reason to believe that the price of green hydrogen would certainly decrease over the uh, years to come.
Okay. So this was about direct electrification, production of green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, as you can see, can be used in some other ways. But then we come to the more complex part, uh, because if we cannot use hydrogen and need green fuels instead, then the, uh, a number of options open up. Because you can either capture CO2 with carbon capture or nitrogen, combine it with hydrogen to produce what's called e-fuels, electrofuels or green fuels, or you can utilize biomass to waste to produce some kind of bio crude oil, combine this with the hydrogen from the electrolyzers and refine this into green fuels. And I think we'll look further into what is actually behind these boxes down here. Um, so if you, we, we try to, to elaborate a bit on the flow sheet before, uh, and it, there, there's a risk that this gets a bit complex, but, but I do hope that you can uh, nevertheless follow me. We have here again, energy sources, uh, renewables and biomass waste over here. We have end users on the other side, and then we have some kind of intermediate and fuel uh, that we now will connect with, uh, with, with arrows. Today we have refineries that produce uh, gasoline, diesel, and jet for our uh, end users. Uh, that is uh, the world of today. Well, of course, then we can, uh, as we've already seen, we will see batteries, direct electrification of uh, especially uh, vehicles, but also to a certain extent, uh, regional trucks, also to a certain extent, ferries, and to a very limited extent, uh, airplanes in the future. We have the electrolysis, as we talked about, producing hydrogen. Hydrogen can also be used in trucks shipping and aviation in the uh, future. Then we have all our uh, power stations, waste energy units, cement factories, but we have large CO2 emissions. Well, we can retrofit these with uh, carbon capture to capture the CO2. The CO2 then can go into a methanol synthesis, producing methanol together with, and remark, mark this small arrow here, hydrogen, we, we have not and put another arrow down here in order to not clutter the, the drawing even more. But we can combine CO2 and hydrogen to produce methanol or DME, a derived uh, fuel. So methanol or DME can be utilized uh, more or less as a drop-in fuel in cars, in uh, trucks, and in ferries. Uh, especially for shipping, we see that uh, Maersk, the large container shipping company, is really, really uh, Moving forward on this, they have ordered uh, no, none, no less than 12 full-size container vessels to be uh, powered by methanol. Uh, uh, and they are going to be delivered from uh, 23. It's only two years away from now, now that they will get, or even less than two years from now, they will have the first full-size container vessel sailing on methanol. So Maersk is at the moment uh, really trying to secure supply of very large quantities of methanol because it is really uh, to, to have these container vessels going on methanol is, uh, is quite, uh, takes quite a lot of fuel. But methanol cannot be used as aviation fuel. We can convert the methanol by using additional hydrogen into gasoline or jet fuel. Gasoline can, of course, be used as a drop-in fuel in a transition period, just as we use gasoline today. Or jet fuel can be used as a synthetic aviation fuel that can replace the fossil part. Another way to actually use our biomass and waste is instead of combusting it, a waste energy plant or a power plant, we can actually take the biomass to waste and uh, put it through a, a several novel technologies like pyrolysis and liquefaction, where you, with addition of hydrogen, can produce a bio-crude oil. It's to a certain extent similar to the fossil crude oil that we uh, uh, produce from, from, uh, from the North Sea, etc., for instance, but not completely like it. It needs uh, some refining that is not yet in place yet, uh, but, but uh, it can be refined and turned into the uh, various uh, either gasoline or diesel needed for the end consumers. So that is 
a completely different way using advanced biofuels, but again, remarked that an addition of hydrogen is needed. So the electrolysis and the power up here is needed wherever, what, whichever process we use here. Even also, if we go to the uh, biogas, where we actually have an anaerobic digestion of the biomass, we can produce biogas, upgrade it, and put it into the natural gas network. Natural gas is today used in trucks and ferries already, so, so it's dropping here to, to produce a fossil-free alternative. We can, there's a lot of CO2 in the biogas. We can add, add more hydrogen to mesonize it to produce even more natural gas that way. We can even, alternatively, we can go for bioethanol, ferment the uh, biomass, producing ethanol, which can also be used as a drop in fuel. It's quite well known. I mean, ethanol has been used as a fuel, in, especially in Brazil, for many, many years. Uh, so, so it's quite well known. The only thing is that second generation bioethanol, uh, where, where we, which we talk about here, is not really fully developed. We can also, if we don't like to produce natural gas, actually convert the biogas back to the sun gas and go to methanol to produce liquid fuels instead. In the future, it might also be possible to take the biomass, put it in a gasifier, produce this called so-called syn gas with CO, CO and CO2, and produce methanol liquid fuels. Or we could go, instead of producing methanol, you could actually convert this into a crude oil through the fissure drops process. That process is also very well known. It has been uh, developed in particular in South Africa, uh, where they were not able to buy crude oil from the uh, international markets during the uh, embargo uh, back in the 80s uh, due to the apartheid. So therefore, fissure drops has been proven on a very large industrial scale in South Africa. Uh, and are also utilized uh, other places in the world today. So it's a well-known technology, just as well as methanol technology is a very, very well-known technology. Again, hydrogen, remark hydrogen needed more or less everywhere in order to upgrade uh, what we have. We need CO2 in the future. It might be that we do not have that many plants to do carbon capture on the plants because they will eventually be closed down. So we'll actually, and that's a strange thing now, will lack CO2 to produce uh, the liquid fuels here. So in the future, we assume that CO2 will be captured directly from the air, making a very nice uh, circular economy of capturing CO2 from the air, producing liquid fuels and, and emit CO2 back to the air again uh, in our transport sector. And then of course, we can also capture instead of CO2, we can capture nitrogen from the air. It's quite abundant. Uh, Combine it with the hydrogen and the ammonia synthesis. Ammonia is completely well-known technology, been using on, on a very large scale for fertilized production, uh, but relying on fossil fuels today. Combining this with green ammonia, you can produce ammonia both for fertilizer, but also for shipping. Uh, MAN was delivering the large two-stroke engines for, uh, for, for large size container vessels, et cetera expect to have uh, ammonia powered uh, engine on the market in 24. Uh, they are making tests at the moment. It seems pretty sure that the, this is going to, to uh, mature. Uh, so in from 24, it would be possible to actually order large scale uh, ships uh, utilizing ammonia rather than uh, methanol or any other fossil fuel. The very nice thing about ammonia is that it does not require, it is only hydrogen and nitrogen from air. There's no CO2 involved in the making of the uh, ammonia and there's no CO2 emission whatsoever. I know this is uh, pretty complex, especially uh, at this uh, time of the evening, but, but nevertheless, I do hope that this gives you a bit of an overview about the complexities and the fact that power tracks and advanced biofuels a large family of technologies. And it's not necessarily easy to pick the winner at this moment, because a number of these technologies will most likely uh, be developed in parallel. 
and we'll see which one will mature as the most promising one over the coming years. Uh, in due respect of the time, I think that we will now turn to uh, some of the uh, examples from uh, Denmark, looking first at, uh, say, the uh, power tracks, not on the advanced biofuels that we have down here, not direct electrification. Um, in Denmark, there has been announced uh, more than six gigawatt of electrolysis uh, plants uh, in our country uh, until uh, 2030. Uh, just giving you, I'll not go through them, but just to give you an impression about the number of projects uh, being, uh, that are uh, in the planning at the moment. Uh, and uh, really kicking in around 25, and then especially in, in uh, 2030, uh, a large number also uh, comes in. Um, to, to focus on, uh, say, yeah, of course, we have the Energy Island where we plan to have a certain power to facility at the island itself. Then we have a large scale green ammonia production in uh, the city of Esberg uh, with one gigawatt of uh, electrolysis being planned there. Uh, to produce ammonia for fertilized production, uh, to, to provide green fertilizer for, uh, for the agricultural sector. And then in Copenhagen, we have the uh, Green Fuels for Denmark project with uh, 1.3 gigawatt of electrolysis, uh, producing both uh, e-methanol for, for uh, shipping and uh, jet fuel for aviation. Uh, I'll go a bit more into details about the Green Fuels for Denmark. Uh, and for that, I also have uh, this video that, oops, I don't know if you can see anything, it seems that uh, something went on. Can you see anything? We see a desktop image. See, yes, exactly. You see the desktop, that was hard. <laughs> so we try just to restart it. And then I need to share the screen again. Sorry for the mess up. Yes, so that is the Green Fuel for Denmark project. Uh, and it will rely on, we have the company after uh, operating a lot of wind farms. So they will construct a wind farm in the Baltic Sea to power the electrolysis in the first phase, delivering hydrogen, uh, which will be offtaken by a company called DSV, which is a large uh, trucking company. Uh, they will have a number of trucks running on hydrogen. That is the first phase where we only have 10 megawatt of electrolysis. Uh, so it's, it's in that sense fairly modest, uh, but will be used as a building block for the next phase uh, where we will combine the hydrogen with CO2 also from a power plant owned by Oster, biomass fired power plant. So it's 
actually uh, carbon neutral uh, in the first place, we'll capture the CO2 from the flue gas, combine with hydrogen in a fuel synthesis plant and producing light distillate, that is marine fuel and jet fuel. And then eventually uh, we will uh, scale this up uh, in uh, phase three to 1.3 gigawatt. The marine fuel will be offtaken by both Maersk, the large shipping company, and DFDS, uh, a large ferry company in Denmark. The jet fuel will go to Copenhagen Airport and Scandinavian Airlines. All of the off-takers here are partners in the project. And we believe that actually bringing together, on one hand, the operator of the wind turbines, power plant, and the uh, fuel production facilities, and on the other hand, the off-takers, is very, very important in this early phases. There is not really a market yet for green aviation fuel or green uh, marine fuel. So therefore, in order to actually uh, have a certain security when you invest in such a plant, to have an agreed offtake and have all the value chain together, is very important. <coughs> Sorry. In addition, the plant is being placed and located <coughs> in uh, Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, uh, we have a large district heating network uh, that supplies heating, domestic heating to all citizens in Copenhagen. There's a lot of waste heat from these plants because all the uh, steps in conversion from power to hydrogen and further to jet fuel, etc. Nothing is with 100% conversion efficiency, as we all know. But we also know that energy is, after all, not lost. It is usually just rejected as waste heat. The waste heat can be recovered and utilized for district heating in Copenhagen. So that's really the benefit uh, of lo locating the plant in Copenhagen, uh, that we can utilize the waste heat in a useful way. <clears throat> in the uh, final uh, phase, it'll actually produce the required amount of jet fuel for Copenhagen Airport that will cover approximately 30% of the uh, Copenhagen Airport fuel consumption. And that is uh, the fuel consumption uh, before measure before Corona. Uh, I say that today it could probably uh, cover more or less everything uh, due to the quite limited traffic at uh, Copenhagen Airport. So with this project, uh, not only are we trying to realize uh, these power to X fuels, but also doing it uh, in a complete value chain uh, to ensure the offtake until in the future where we have a fully uh, functional market that will, where you can produce and sell it on the market. Uh, so, so that way we, we hope to break ground here with, with having a value chain project. If you now look into what's called advanced biofuels or e-biofuels, where we actually, instead of uh, doing all this uh, carbon capture, we actually uh, utilize the biomass and uh, as I said, in some way, produce a bio crude oil and put it in a refinery. We can also produce uh, e <coughs> green fuels, but also supplement it with hydrogen from electrolysis. One of the projects we are looking into here is called hydrothermal liquefaction. Behind this, uh, perhaps strange word, uh, HTL, hydrothermal liquefaction, we feed this process with uh, household waste, manure, shoot slots, with straw in minutes. And that, in that process, it does what nature has been doing, uh, takes take a million years. It will produce a crude oil, a bio crude oil that is not completely like the uh, fossil crude oil, but nevertheless, a bio crude oil. This bio crude oil needs to be so-called hydrated in order to upgrade it, uh, make it stable for uh, refining. Uh, that requires hydrogen from wind power. So uh, hydrogen going in here, having an upgraded bio crude going to a refinery, where you might even supplement it with even more hydrogen to produce the right desired cuts of gasoline, jet fuel, and fuel oil for, for shipping. Uh, there's also a certain CO2 emission from uh, the HDL process itself here, 
that CO2 can eventually be combined with even more hydrogen to a methanol plant and also that go to, to, uh, to, to the uh, transport sector. And then uh, as a quite, I think, nice touch about the process is that the, as a byproduct, it actually produces phosphor at a very, very pure level that can be returned as a valuable nutrition to the uh, agricultural sector. Um, the biocrude here is actually on an energy base, 80% of the uh, biomass going in here, 80% of the energy comes out in the biocrude, which is very, very substantial. Then we have the product gas, which is mainly CO2, which we can then combine with methanol. We have the solids here, which is uh, more than 90% phosphor, and then we have a bit of waste heat that can be uh, utilized for district heating. But that's a completely different way of producing uh, e-fuels here, where we actually take the biomass put it through this process, but again, combine it with hydrogen to produce the desired end products over here. This technology is not completely developed yet, but nevertheless, a full-scale demonstration plant is just about to go into operation in Norway. Uh, and the uh, real uh, missing link here is actually not the process itself, but rather the uh, final refining of the uh, biocrude. And for that part, we are uh, involved with a large partnership of companies, uh, both covering the uh, fuel producers, but uh, and the technology provider of the HDL product, uh, Steba Energy, Shell is involved for, for the refining of the uh, bio crude. And then we have again Maersk, uh, several ports. We have uh, several airports involved in actually to, to actually uh, certify the fuel that is uh, produced here. So the upgrading and uh, of the bio oil is really the uh, key part of this uh, to to uh, to produce uh, green fuels for also aviation and shipping. So that is uh, another example that being a bit more uh, perhaps in development, whereas the green fuels for Denmark project in Copenhagen I showed you before, that is really moving forward and being uh, engineered at the moment. With that said, uh, I think that I have spent perhaps even a bit more time than you anticipated, Ken. I'm very happy that, uh, I, uh, that you didn't interrupt me and uh, I had the, the opportunity to give you this uh, introduction to Powertrex. I'd say that from our point of view, e-fuels and bio-e-fuels are really needed to mitigate the climate change. In order to get this rolling, I think that partnerships are really uh, instrumental to, to have uh, value, the entire value chain involved in the projects in the early phases. Otherwise, you, you, you cannot really make, uh, meet uh, production and demand uh, when you don't have a market. And then perhaps also some regular changes to promote the green hydrogen. I think this is really underway and uh, being developed at uh, very many European countries at the moment, including the UK also, actually. In the long term, I believe that we need an integrated market. And for that, I think that we need a hydrogen backbone network throughout Europe, uh, comparable to the backbone gas transmission network we have today. And we also need to uh, recover CO2 wherever that is uh, produced, so to speak, uh, captured to have CO2 hubs and terminals to bring CO2 to where we actually need to combine it with hydrogen to produce the fuels. And then, of course, in order to make this cost competitive, the price of electrolysis and the renewable power needs to decrease. Uh, we believe it will do so. Uh, so uh, that is uh, at least the vision for uh, how, to, how to decarbonize our transport sector. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I, I hope that uh, you, you are still, still with me.